morning. I'm glad you're here. Good morning. Welcome, everybody. If we've never met before, I've seen a lot of new faces this week. I just want to say my name is Tim. I'm one of the pastors here at Faith Community. It's really an honor to host you today. We're continuing a series uh, in the book of Acts this morning where we're reading about how the Lord Jesus led the church out among people and into places that they never could have imagined. And we're going to be uh, praying together in a unique way during this series and for the rest of the year, okay? Last week, I introduced you to these little post-it notes. Uh, they look like this. You'll see one on the screen as well. And across the top, uh, it says Francis. And Francis stands for friend, relative, acquaintance, neighbor, coworker, enemy, and, or stranger. And what we're going to be doing this year is praying uh, for these people in our lives every day uh, until next fall. Okay, now, if you were not here last week or you're just visiting, you're just hearing about this for the first time, we've got a bunch of these post-it notes on the tables as you leave today so you can grab a stack for yourselves. We think one or two of these per family would be enough for you and your kids to participate in this. But last week, I asked you to write down, that your homework was write down the name of a friend that you're going to pray for every day for the next year. Okay, this week, we're going to add relative. Okay, so I've got my little post-it here. You can see I wrote relative, and then I wrote his name uh, here, and I'm going to pray for him every day over the next year as well. And I'm going to take this and post it right underneath my friend's name on my bathroom mirror because that's someplace I'll see it every day. Okay, so that's your homework this week is to add a relative who's far from God to your prayer list for the next year. Everybody got it? One relative who's far from God that you're going to pray for. And I know you, you're going to write down five and that's your business. Okay, but you got to do it every day. All right. So before we, um, before we even open God's word together, we're actually going to take time to pray as a congregation for some of these names. Here's, and this is a scripture, by the way, I wanted to share with you a scripture that's always helped me uh, as I'm praying for family and friends. It's from 2 Corinthians 4, 6. It says, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. It's just a reminder that as impossible as it may seem, remember we're praying for people that we just can't even hardly imagine what it would be like for them to be joyfully and fully surrendered to Jesus. As impossible as that may seem, we're praying to a God who said, let light shine out of darkness. And it was so. And that's how we can pray for our friends. So let's just take a moment right now. I'm going to give you just a, a few seconds on your own. Would you lift up a friend or relative and ask God right now to shine the light uh, of the glory of God in the face of Jesus in their hearts? Would you pray for the person on your right and on your left this morning that God would bless them, speak them, and minister to them right now? Our Father in heaven, then as we come to your word this morning, we bring these names before you and we just feel our utter weakness, the utter impossibility of what we're asking you are the God who said, let light shine out of darkness. So would you do that in their hearts? God, would you even now, even this week, cause the things that our friends and family are trusting in to fail them, that they might feel their sense of need for you? God, we bring before you this week our local schools and the university down the road that just began classes. Would you graciously allow, God, that every kid that calls Faith Community home that they would see you more clearly this year? Would you give the gift of faith and add to that faith love and knowledge and discernment and fill them, even when they're little, fill our students with joy and courage, fill them with, with power and with love. We pray for the university this year that you would do a mighty work among students. God, give them courage. Put them in all the right places at the right times. We pray for every administrator, every teacher, that you would do extraordinary work. We ask it in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. All right. 
All right, why don't you turn with me to our reading today. We're going to be in the book of Acts, chapter 8. You can find that on page 916 in a uh, Bible in the chair in front of you. I'd love for you to follow along today. Again, we're just reading chapters 6 through 11 in this series because in these chapters, uh, Jesus just pushes the church out into the world in a really unique way. And that, that story is going to take a huge leap forward in our reading today. Last week, just in case you weren't here, you're visiting this morning, last week in chapter 6, the church faced its first really serious uh, internal conflict. And the result of that was a whole new generation of leaders that were raised up who are culturally savvy, well-traveled guys. And the reading last week ended this way. This is kind of our theme verse for the fall. Chapter 6, verse 7 said, And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Now, if we had kept reading last week, you would see that one of those new leaders that was raised up, a guy named Stephen, his preaching uh, got him in a lot of trouble, and actually he was murdered by a mob in Jerusalem, and a great persecution broke out against the church, uh, and it, it's what the Lord used to ultimately push the church out of Jerusalem, uh, and that's where we pick up the story today. So here's uh, Acts chapter 8, and we're going to start our reading in verse 4. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds, with one accord, paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip, and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus." Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning, we're just going to uh, ask quickly, uh, what can we learn about gospel movements? When Jesus pushes his church out into the world, what are some of the things that we might expect? And first, uh, we see that uh, there's an organic, kind of spontaneous, ground-up stirring in the church in gospel movements. Remember at this point, if you were here last week, remember the church in Jerusalem at this point is conservatively, we're talking about like 20,000 people or something like that. And verse 1 says that all of them except the apostles were scattered after Stephen's death. death. Now up to this point, uh, in the book of Acts, really the apostles and then that second generation of leaders, they've been doing all of the preaching in the church. But now, 
Verse 4 says, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. That word preaching is, <clears throat> excuse me, it's uh, yuan galidzo. Yuan galidzo, it's just, it's evangelism. They went about evangelizing. And that uh, evangelism includes preaching, uh, the kind of thing that I'm doing right now. But it's mu actually much, much more than that as well. Uh, it's just talking about, or it can include just talking to people about Jesus person to person at the gym, over a cup of coffee, on a walk or wherever. I ran across two or three uh, sources this week that translated verse 4 as gossiping the gospel. Everywhere they went, it said pe the people went about gossiping the gospel. It's just a spontaneous sharing about Jesus and what he's done in all the places that we live, work, play, and learn. I think I've shared this with you before. It's been, you know, a couple of years probably, but the uh, Nepal, the kingdom of Nepal has the second or third fastest growing church in the world right now. And I, I shared with you, it, it's because uh, of the way they gossip the gospel. So in Nepal, it's illegal to evangelize. You can be thrown in prison for trying to convert someone. But I shared with you a Christianity Today article about how the gospel is moving through groups of women because they just talk. Uh, they, they get together, they share about their sick kids, they pray for each other's kids, they talk about the problems they're having with their husbands and the way that Jesus is healing them and ministering to them. And whole households are coming to faith in Nepal, a country with very few ordained clergy, because women just talk. They just know how to gossip the gospel. Uh, it was so interesting this week. So it's been a couple of years since I read that article. So I wanted to just kind of catch up, you know, what's new in Nepal. So I, I went to Uncle Google, as we all would, you know, to get our news. And said, I just typed in news on the church in Nepal. The, all the top hits were from NPR, of all places. It was fascinating to read about NPR trying to understand the growth of the church in Nepal. Because all of their, they point to economic and social factors that are making this happen. Now, uh, is, it tr is that untrue? Do economic and social factors matter in gospel movements? Well, of course they do. But that doesn't mean that it's not from the Spirit because Jesus is ascended and he controls economies and all kinds of social factors. So in a gospel movement, there's this sense of like a whole church or a whole generation of churches having this sense of like, my goodness, something new is happening. Something is being stirred up, and there's just kind of a ground up, spontaneous. Um, well, of course, we talk about Jesus. What on earth else would we talk about? And that's that's uh, number one. Number two, a second observation about gospel movements as Jesus pushes the church into the world is uh, I've been trying to find the right word. I don't know if this is the right word, but uh, let's call it holistic. It's all there in verses five through eight. But one of the things that you observe about gospel movements is that there's this holistic transformation of people, families, and cities. If you look at verses 5 through 8, you can see Philip's ministry was characterized by the word, by deed, uh, by a, a completely unheard of kind of community, and by a, a transformed city. I'll just take those one at a time real quick. So the word, verse 5 says, Philip went down to the city in Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. That's actually a different word than the one in verse 4. This is talking about public preaching. Philip went down and got in public and he preached the word and the crowds paid attention to what he was saying. And then in verse 12, it says, they believed Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus. It's just a reminder that we are first and foremost above all ambassadors of Christ. And that means that we bring a word. We bring a body of information. We lift up the message of the atoning death and resurrection of Jesus and say this has to be believed to be saved. Everything else begins there. Um, we're, we'll talk about what Philip did in, in a minute, but just notice in verse 6, it's the words and, and deeds of Philip that get people's attention, okay? Okay. But in verse 12, it's ultimately the word that they believe on. You notice these, these folks, you know, magic was not new to them. Okay, we learned because Simon is a part of the picture that, you know, seeing amazing things, seeing the fireworks and spiritual things happening, they were used to that. They saw that all the time. If Philip had just come with fireworks, 
they would have concluded, oh, it's another great magician. But you see in verse 12, ultimately it's the word that he brings that actually brings salvation and joy to this city. With that said then, there were deeds. It wasn't just minds that were impacted, but verse 6 says, the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them and many who were paralyzed or lame or healed. And so in, in gospel movements, what you'll see are people in spiritual and physical bondage experiencing liberation in Jesus' name. And it strikes me, you know, so in the, if you were to read the first five chapters of Acts, we see the apostles doing all the things that Jesus used to do. Now we're seeing another generation of leader doing all the same things that Jesus used to do. We said in the first week of this series, the ascension of Jesus is like, you, you know, a, a Jesus bomb going off in the universe so that the who Jesus was and the things that he did are everywhere, wherever his people are, wherever the church goes. And we see that in Philip. Uh, in scripture, uh, one of the things that we see is that human misery is not treated in a real simplistic or reductionistic kind of way. Uh, sometimes you'll see people treat human misery like it's always only a spiritual issue. It, it's always the devil or spirits or supernatural forces or something like that. Well, the Bible doesn't assume that. What we see in this story is if you're paralyzed or crippled, the assumption is you need healing, not to have something cast out of you. The other way to be completely overly simplistic is to assume, and this is the world that we live in now, but to assume that everything is just physical. If you have a problem, the prevailing wisdom is it's, it's physiological, it's medical, economic, social, and that's just an incredibly simplistic and silly way to think about things. And the Bible's approach is much more nuanced, that we are both spiritual and physical creatures, and both your soul and body need healing. And so we come preaching the word and praying and meeting people's physical and tangible needs. There isn't time today, but it would be really interesting sometime to do a study on the reports uh, from missionaries that come in about how people in different contexts come to faith in Jesus. Because what you would see is that Muslims do not come to faith in Jesus the way that Hindu people do. And Westerners come to Jesus in yet another way. And Westerners coming out of the occult or drug culture come in yet another way. But that, that there are similarities. And so, uh, for our purposes, just observe, some people had spiritual needs, some people had physical needs, and in a gospel movement, the whole person is taken into account, and that principle remains the same. And what happens in verse 8 is that when, the, when they saw what Philip was doing and saw what was happening, it says, there was much joy in that city. It doesn't just say there was a lot of joy among the Christians. It says the whole city rejoiced as they saw the way that the church was uh, liberating people spiritually and physically. Last week I said uh, the greatest need in our context, okay, in the St. Croix Valley, the greatest needs are community, council, and kids. And uh, it struck me last week, this has just stayed with me all week, that the, uh, the apostles in response to that need said, we know our role. We're going to commit to the ministry of the word and to prayer. And to prayer. That's just stuck with me all week. That there are certain things that just cannot happen in the church without not only the ministry of the word, but also we, in prayer. If there's going to be spiritual and, and physical liberation, if, he, if marriages are going to be made whole, if families are going to be made whole, prayer is actually like my job. <laughs> like I'm going to punch in and go pray. That's what, anyway, that's just me. In Acts chapter 8 then, 
Another observation about gospel movements is that wherever the Spirit leads, there's going to be a really unique kind of community. And th so this cannot be overstated. The chapters we're reading in this series are some of the most significant and world-changing chapters in the whole Bible. Uh, the I we live in the world we live in because of these chapters. The idea that people from different races, ethnicities, and classes not only could be one, but that we should be one is completely new in the ancient world. There is no one in the ancient world that taught that or believed that. And now that idea that people from different ethnicities, races, and classes should be one, it's in the Old Testament in kind of a seed form. But Acts chapter 8 is the first time that I'm aware of in history where you see it on a massive or a large scale. And as far as I know, that's beyond dispute. Okay? I'm open to correction if you know something that I don't know. Uh, but as far as I know, there is no other source in the ancient world for this idea. If you're a Bible reader or you just appreciate history, you've probably heard that the Samaritans were despised by everybody. The, the, they were viewed by Jews and Arabs as racially inferior. They were religiously heretical. The conflict between Samaritan and Jews went back eons. Jews and Samaritans hated each other. And yet here's a Jewish man, Philip, calling Samaritans to the Jewish Messiah and then healing them and eating with them and spending time with them and every day making himself impure and he doesn't seem to care. That's part of what the Samaritans saw in Philip as well. And then verse 12 says, when they believed Philip as he preached the good news, they were baptized, both men and women. Did you catch that? They were baptized. Baptism is the way that Christians recognize each other. It's the secret handshake, so to speak. You know what I mean? Baptism is how you recognize family when you see them. And, and Philip is putting that sign on Israel's enemies, ancient, ancient enemies. And so there's, that's why there's this really interesting episode. In verses 14 through 17, it says, When the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John. I mean, Peter and John, these are the, this is the man, okay? I mean, these are the two pillars of, of the church, they send them down to Samaria, and it says they came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he'd not yet fallen on any of them, but they'd only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is really, really unique, and the point is definitely not to teach about how we receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, there's no pattern being established here. And there's no command in the New Testament to have someone lay hands on you subsequent to salvation to receive the Holy Spirit. The point is this. The apostles understood that the, the baptism of Samaritans could tear the church completely apart. So uh, in our reading last week, it ended by saying, gobs of priests became obedient to the faith, just as an example. Samaritans hated priests. They rejected the whole Jewish temple system and they thought the priests were completely illegitimate. It was all a hoax and they let them know that. I mean, there was deep animosity between these groups of people. So word comes in now that Philip, you know, the Greek speaking guy that they laid hands on, he's down in Samaria dunking people in Jesus' name. What do you think that's about to do to the church? And so they send Peter and John down to Samaria to say, what is going on? And it's through these two that God uh, gives the gift of the Holy Spirit. This, the last time that John was in Samaria is Luke chapter 9, where he says, where the Samaritans are mean to them. And John says, Jesus, you want me to call down fire from heaven and smoke these people? Because I will just do it right now. That's the last conversation John had with Samaritans. And here he is, bringing a completely different kind of fire in Jesus' name. These are Jews from Jerusalem coming down to say, we are so glad you are here. 
we are so glad for what Jesus is apparently doing in your midst that you've believed in him and that he is giving you the spirit. We are so glad that you are a part of us and we affirm and we love what God is doing. So the, the point of the story today, this is not about how you receive the Holy Spirit. This is completely unprecedented in Scripture. The whole point is to say, do you understand how serious God is about racial and ethnic and class unity in his church? That's the point. Galatians 3.27 says, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ, and there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, but you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's the point of the story that we read today. God actually, think about this, please, that God actually withholds the gift of the Spirit from baptized believers until Peter and John can get there and see it for themselves. That's how serious he is about racial and ethnic unity in, in his people. Last thing that we observe is that gospel movements create a huge mess and that God provides an answer for that. In the midst of this joy, in the city. I love the way verses 8 and 9 are written. There was joy in the city, but there was a man named Simon. That's what verse 9 says. Verse 9, there was a man named Simon. He had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying he was somebody great. I mean, just the contrast between Simon and Philip are so awesome. And they all paid attention to him, from the least to the greatest, saying, this guy is the power of God that's called great. Now, what they're really saying there, essentially they're saying, this is a God in the flesh. That's what they believed about Simon. So that's where he's coming from. Now, we just finished several months in the Gospel of John. Just in case you're visiting, one of the themes of the Gospel of John is that there is a thing called true belief and false belief, true disciple and false discipleship. And here, here we have Simon who believed, verse 13, he himself believed and he was baptized. And then it says he followed Philip around closely. All the markers, uh, you know, external markers of discipleship. Yet Peter says to him in verse 20, may your money die with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter for your heart is not right before God. In other words, your heart is unconverted. You're still acting and thinking like a magician, like you think you can manipulate God the way you've been manipulating other spiritual things, but you can't. This is not magic. It's grace, and you have no part in it. And he says in verse 22, repent therefore of this wickedness and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven, for I see you're in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. That, that phrase, the gall of bitterness, it's borrowed from the Old Testament. And it's a phrase that the Old Testament uses to describe false teachers who were trying to lead Israel into the worship of other gods. It, it, um, he, Peter is saying, you, you are in this for something other than Jesus. Power, money, control, I don't know. But you're, you, you got a bad taste about you, man. And he gives him this like incredibly stern rebuke because he's like pulling this bitter root out of the church community. So just last observation, gospel movements, are they just create a mess. And the, the way the Samaritans are described, you know, they pay attention to this guy, they pay attention to this guy, they're really enamored with the fireworks shows and everything. Well, of course. And once again, God's answer is to provide a certain kind of humble, dependent, spirit-filled people. I think, I think Luke's point in sharing this story is to show us in gospel movements, leaders are people who are trusted to follow the Spirit's leading. Okay, there's tremendous freedom and very little control. Why did Philip go to Samaria in the first place? We don't, we don't know. But you do not get the sense that there was like a meeting where the apostles were like, hey, Philip, there's this unreached people group called Samaria. Why don't you go preach? No way. That's... That meeting never happened. 
uh, there's just a sense that the Spirit is leading and he, has, he feels the freedom to go. And especially next week, you're going to read, there is no human master plan getting itself worked out. Philip was called by the church because he was a certain kind of person. A, a person of great character, full of the Spirit, and full of wisdom. And in gospel movements, those kinds of people are free to just go for it. In the first few years of the church, it's the apostles who are doing all the leading, all the initiating, all the preaching and so on. Well, all that's changed now. And a whole new generation of leaders is doing all the initiating, all the leading, and the apostles just come along. Instead of say, do as I tell you, they're saying, follow the lead of the spirit and we will, come, we will take care of you. So, you know, what should we do with some of this? Listen, if God opens a door for you to do something, do it. You don't, need to, you don't need to call me. I mean, you can call me about it or whoever, but the message is go for it. Uh, we would love to know. We'd love to know the things that God is doing, but you want to start a ministry in your neighborhood? God is opening a door at your gym or on your athletic team or in your dorm or something like that. The message of Acts is go for it. Follow the lead of the Spirit. Just know you're going to make a huge mess, and it's fine. Um, don't assume that when you see a need, that the answer is to get the church to get another program going. I just was talking with an older gentleman here like two months ago uh, that he's doing a prison ministry that I didn't even know existed. I'm like, great, go for it. Uh, we got a ministry going at a halfway house in North Hudson. I say, go for it. Keep going. Keep doing it. I mean... If God opens a door for you, the answer is a, is a particular kind of leader and laborer, not always that the whole church now has to get behind this new thing. And if, if you see a need, this happens to me all the time, you see a need and you think, oh man, I wish we could do X, Y, or Z, but you just know you're not the Philip. You know you're not the organizational leader that's going to move this whole thing forward. Pray for a Philip. Ask God to raise up a laborer for the need that you see. Romans 12, 3 says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. You're not the answer to every problem, but think of yourself with sober judgment and use the gifts that God has assigned to you in faith. And let the Spirit of God lead and build up the church in the way that he sees fit. One more thing as we prepare to go for, to communion. And uh, ushers, you guys can go ahead and start serving communion, uh, bring the bread forward and things like that. Just one more observation. This is my, this might be my favorite thing, but this is the way the story ends in verse 25. Now, when Peter and John had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Isn't that interesting? Here's the observation. They did not preach in Samaritan villages on their way down. You notice that? Why? Because they can't even imagine it. They have no, like, they cannot fathom what it would look like for Samaritans to know Jesus. It isn't until they see their little brother Philip preaching and converting and baptizing people in Jesus' name that they're like, oh, this is what could happen. And then on their way back, they preach in all the Samaritan villages as they go. I just think that's incredible. Here are, the, here are the dudes. I mean, the pillars of the church learning from young Philip about how to reach people who've never even heard of Jesus. And when they see him doing it, they're filled with courage and boldness and they do it as well. What is Luke's point in sharing all this? Is to say three, three things. Number one, Listen to the Spirit and go for it. Just do it. Somebody should make that a slogan. It would just go, so, it'd be viral. If, if, you, if you feel the Lord leading you to do something, you see a need, a door opens for you, the, the word is just do it. Just go for it. Second, understand when you do, it is bound to create a mess. Okay? leading people into relationship with Jesus who have no... I mean, these people were in love with magic and all kinds of weird stuff. Of course they had a bunch of problems coming into the church. 
And I think the message of Luke is, it's okay. Do it anyway and embrace the mess and trust that the Spirit will also provide what is needed to keep the church from exploding all over the place. And third, and this is really what I want you to reflect on as we go to communion, remember that it's a gift. It's all a gift. Christ died for you. He rose again for you. He's ascended to the right hand of the Father and he's interceding for you right now. And it's all a gift. You cannot buy it. It's not something you can buy. It's something Jesus has done for you. And it's not magic. It's just all of grace. And it's not something you can manipulate. We're not coming to communion today to try to manipulate something out of God. God is God. We are not. We come and we surrender our lives to him. We offer our lives as they are to him. So as we come, this is what I want you to reflect on as we come to communion. Just say, Lord Jesus, here's my, here's my life. And I offer it once again for your service. And here, are the, here are the things that I need in my life. And I, God, give me grace to endure the mess, whatever the mess will be. And finally, just I receive you by faith. I'm not trying to manipulate you. I'm not trying to buy anything from you. I come by faith, your life for mine, your death for mine, and you're God, and I'm not. All right, would you do that as we prepare for communion?